Um, so thanks for coming. Um, why don't we start off with the very first question, which is why should we study environmental change and migration in the first place? I think it's important partly because environmental change has always been important in migration. Uh, where I work in, in West Java, for example, uh, in, in my study areas there was a, a big volcanic eruption and large numbers of people had to move. And that was a very obvious case, but uh, in fact environmental factors also have been very significant in all of the other villages which I've studied, but they are contributory factors rather than the overwhelming factor in people's migration. I think it's always been important, but because we ask people why they move, uh, they give the reasons that triggered their move rather than go into all the deeper underlying forces. And environment very often is one of those deeper underlying elements in it. And I think as we've become more sophisticated in our understanding of migration, we realise that it is uh, of significance. The other reason, I think, is that it is going to become more important. I think uh, with the uh, impact of climate change, we know that environmental factors are going to be more significant in the future uh, than they have been in the past. And accommodating them in our migration study, I believe, is a, is a really important priority. So then in thinking about this relationship, how should we conceptualise their interaction and how can we think of the environment because it's such a, it's such a big concept? I think that's a, that's a very good question. The, the reality is that very often in migration studies, we study migrants, they're the people who move. But in fact, if we're going to understand the full implications of the relationship between environment and migration, I think we have to study non-migrants as well. Uh, and, and that makes it very difficult for migration study, which is almost certainly, almost always of, of, of migrants themselves. People um, adjust to uh, environmental change, not just through migration, and I think this is one of the, the problems of a lot of, uh, of the discourse about migration, that environmental change equals migration. The reality is that there are many coping mechanisms open to communities and people in order to adjust to that climate change. Not only that, there are many people uh, who don't adjust at all, many people who just have to put up with the uh, reduced livelihood, the uh, lower levels of living which come about because of, uh, of environmental change. So I think that the first issue about uh, uh, studying environment and migration is that we have to study it in a wider context of environmental change uh, and the, the range of, of impacts that it, that it could have. Um, a second factor I think which is important is that uh, there's been a tendency to think of environmental impact on migration as displacement. Uh, in my example of a volcanic explosion in uh, West Java, people had to move. There was no alternative but to move. But that's only one dimension of migration. And very often, uh, and certainly the families that I've studied in Indonesia, um, people have adjusted to environmental change by sending out one or two family members to work in the city for a period of time. And that type of mobility, uh, which isn't a permanent displacement of families, um, isn't picked up in any of, the, any of the major data sources. So to me, it's really important to consider the relationship on mobility rather than just simply on, on displacement uh, migration. Given how complex this relationship is between environmental change and migration, how should researchers design studies to examine the nature and the extent of this relationship? I think one of the, the problems we've had in migration study over the years is that um, we asked migrants why they moved. Uh, now there may be uh, people who moved five years ago, there may be people who moved uh, yesterday, or there may be people in the, in, the, in the process of moving. But when we ask people why they moved, very often uh, the answers we get are the factors which triggered the uh, the, 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 the mobility at a particular time and we can't get at the deeper underlying structural determinants of that mobility. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons we've missed out on environment in the past as being one of those constellation of forces which have impacted on, particularly on people's economies but also in, in other ways as well. I believe quite strongly that we need to uh, not so much develop new theories of migration to, to um, take into account environmental change, but we need to look at the way in which the existing theories um, can accommodate uh, those in environmental uh, 
uh, environmental factors. One of the things which um, I've been working on recently is to look at the um, possible impact between demographic uh, factors as well as uh, environmental factors. And at a global scale, it's very interesting to see that there is a, a coincidence of hotspots of future climate change and what we could call demographic hotspots, places which have still got very high fertility and relatively rapid rates of population growth. So looking at the ways in which um, environmental change interacts with people's livelihoods, with uh, economic factors, but also with demographic factors is, is, is fairly crucial. And the other dimension I think which is important is networks. One of the, uh, I think one of the, the truisms which I've gained out of 30 or 40 years of working in Asia is that migrants hardly ever go uh, to a place that they know nothing about and know no one at that place. Most mobility is along a well-trodden path where family and friends have moved before. Um, and the networks, the linkages which are created by earlier migrations are really fundamental in channeling uh, mobility, but also influencing whether people respond to crisis by moving or not. Um, and I think looking at the ways in which environmental change uh, links with linkages and networks, I think, is, is very important as well. So, so I, I, what I'd suggest is that I think we need to look at our existing body of, of theory and knowledge about migration and, uh, and I guess, make it more environmentally conscious uh, than it has been in the past. Well, in, in speaking about networks and speaking about demographic factors, um, let's talk more generally about how environmental change might interact with other migration determinants? I mean, you've just mentioned two, but uh, how can we conceive them uh, within migration determinant theory? I think uh, one of the, the issues in, in this regard is that so far um, we've been very uh, limited in the way in which we've actually conceptualised environmental change. Uh, the, the, the variables which we've taken to represent environmental change, whether it be flooding or salination or reduced rainfall, have tended to be uh, lacking in sophistication. I, I think that the, uh, what we've tended to do is not really have a, a detailed and full understanding of the, f of the full uh, dimensions of environmental change. And I think one of the things which we really need to do is to come up with uh, better uh, um, measurements of environmental change, better modelling of future likely environmental impacts. Um, and, and I think one of the reasons why we've generally failed to make the connections between environmental change and mobility is a, um, a real lack of ability to be able to uh, measure environmental change uh, in a spatially disaggregated way, but also in, a, in, in an effective way which takes into account uh, temporal as well as spatial dimensions. So I, I think one of the things that we really need to do is to come up with more nuanced, uh, more effective measure of, of, of <laughs> mobility. Me. So, certainly, I mean, one can rep, um, uh, analyse, um, I guess, chains of causation with individual migrants. And certainly in several of the cases which I've, uh, where I've done this in Indonesia, um, the, uh, there is a, almost a sequence whereby an envir in, in environmental impact occurs which impinges on the level of living and ability to, for, to, to earn a, a livelihood which leads to um, a reassessment of uh, people's economic situation which leads to migration. So very often it's a, a sort of linkage along those, uh, along those lines. Um, and that sets real challenges in terms of depth of understanding because uh, being able to uh, reconstruct that sequence of events for individuals and for groups of people is extremely difficult with the sorts of methodologies which we have available to us, which generally um, you know, are very good at picking those uh, initial uh, superficial reasons for migration, but not those deeper underlying forces. Do you think that, that causality should be an objective? Oh. Uh, in studying this relationship and, and that these methods and methodologies that yes. we would use should aim at identifying some sort of cause and effect, whether it be direct 
or a part of a complex interaction? Uh, very definitely. The, uh, I think there's a, it, it's very interesting that in the current literature, the whole focus is on um, environmental change as a cause of migration. It's, uh, I wrote it in my first article on environment migration back in 1996, and I think it was really interesting in summarising the literature at that stage, there was more written about migrants as a cause of environmental change than uh, vice versa. Um, and, uh, and I think it is very important to uh, remember that we're looking at two-way relationships between environment and uh, migration, although it's very much the causality of environmental change leading to, to migration, which is the dominant thing at the moment. But I think one has to be uh, cognizant too that, that migration can have environmental impacts uh, uh, as well. But unravelling those causal chains, those causal connections, I think, must be a, a, a major objective of, of, of our research if we're going to be able to come up with relevant policies, either to facilitate migration or provide alternatives for people. Uh, in, in, in those contexts. We really do need to understand what the triggers are, um, what are the uh, elements which lead to migration or prevent migration uh, in, in, in those contexts. And do you think that there are any methods or methodologies that are particularly stu suited to studying this relationship? I think, the, the, in, in my view, uh, the, the best approaches are mixed methods appro uh, approaches. Uh, it's very, very difficult, I think, to come up with a single uh, uh, approach which is going to give you the depth of understanding of uh, a situation uh, which I think a mixed methods approach can, can undertake. And by that I mean uh, there does need to be, I think, some representative survey work or use of secondary data if we're going to have results which are representative over a bigger, bigger population. But I don't think there's any substitute for um, uh, in-depth investigation, discussions with individuals, uh, considerable interrogation of contextual information. I think when you're looking at environmental impacts, certainly you can get some of that from talking to people and asking people about their experience. But uh, increasingly, uh, uh, secondary data about environmental change with satellite imagery and so on, it is uh, much uh, uh, easier for us these days to get that sort of information uh, in a very sophisticated way to be able to reasonably objectively measure uh, in, in environmental change. Now those sorts of methods are very foreign to most uh, migration scholars and I think we're going to find it and we are finding the transition very hard to modify our existing uh, armory of, of methods in migration to actually include uh, those approaches which actually are more uh, are better suited to collecting that environmental data and then we're we're faced with the challenge of melding that with the um, with the migration information and I think there are there are a lot of challenges that are uh, that are involved there one thing which I think we we don't do enough of in these types of studies um, is longitudinal work because uh, it's very clear that when we're looking at environmental change we're looking at a process over chain uh, over time uh, and looking at people's responses, people's attitudes, people's perceptions and feelings at particular times and when in that whole sequence is the time that people tend to move. Uh, it, I think it's, it's really only approachable if one can study uh, over, over a period of time uh, and, and we really lack those studies which have examined um, episodes of significant environmental change over a period of a couple of years and examine the patterns of mobility associated with them. There are a couple of examples, one in Bangladesh, uh, which I think uh, has a lot of potential. Uh, data there have been collected mainly on fertility uh, over a period of 35 or 40 years. There's a lot of material about environmental change, but the migration data are there as well. So I think there is some data sets around which allow us to uh, potentially investigate what those complex relationships and how they change over time uh, are. But I think that, that longitudinal approach to me is, is certainly uh, one of the most promising avenues that we, that we have. Could you give um, one or two, perhaps if it comes from Bangladesh, uh, examples of studies that you think have uh, particularly, particular added value or insights uh, on, on studying this relationship? Um, and if they're longitudinal studies, then all the better. 
Well, I think I think the Bangla Bangladesh one is the one which, to me, uh, does give some insights into longitudinal uh, change over time. Although that's pretty much ongoing, and and we're yet to see what revelations are going to come out of that. But I think the from from my perspective, what I'm most interested to see is to whether there are, um, if you like. Um, uh, key tipping points over time where migration um, becomes an option or is seen as being an option. At what stage of um, environmental deterioration uh, does uh, migration come into the picture? And then who does it come in for? What, and it, because one of the, uh, the, the key things which I think has been missing in a lot of the literature in this area is that um, environmental impact is seen to be the same for everybody. And yet we know with migration is that migrants are never, ever, ever a representative cross-section of the total population of an area. It's always selective. And, uh, you know, for example, in, in our work in Asia, we know that um, the very poor um, don't move. Uh, they very rarely move. The people who move generally tend to be people who've got some margin for error, who've got some resources which they can use to make that move. And uh, uh, so migration very often is, is, is not available as a, um, a mechanism uh, which the poor can use in order to adjust to environmental change or any other, any other form of crisis. So um, you know, having those sorts of studies which allow us to identify those tipping points and, and identify how they vary for different groups in the population I think is, is, is fairly important. Um, Another study which I think has been very insightful is uh, uh, a study which I know of in the Mekong Delta in, uh, uh, in Vietnam. Uh, that is uh, a study where over time a researcher has lived in a, uh, a couple of villages and been able to observe some very significant changes um, in people's livelihood in fishing um, and how that has been uh, affected by uh, pollution, by, by change over time, and uh, then seen the, uh, a, a gradual transition as people have had to diversify their livelihoods by, uh, by migration. And that, that sort of really in-depth study of, of a community and how the community has dealt with environmental change and actually what the nature of that change has been, I think, is, is very, very useful. One of the, the things which um, has become very popular is to do very substantial um, national studies. Uh, we've got national uh, migration data sets now and people have attempted to correlate that with, with the number of environmental variables, which um, it is, I think, potentially very useful. But one of the things that worries me a great deal is that the data are uh, very, very poor. Um, the, we, the international migration data in the international data sets is extremely limited um, and uh, usually excludes temporary migration uh, and we know uh, from the detailed work that temporary migration is one of the major responses to environmental, environmental change. But also those data sets often um, extend over a, a big period of time, for example, many of them show the United Kingdom as being a country of emigration, whereas in fact it, these days is very much a country of immigration. So there, there are a number of really, I think, uh, um, major problems with that data, let alone the problems with the, with the environmental data. And I think we have to be very cognizant of that. And uh, I guess the, the sort of study which I'd really like to see done is to identify a couple of really significant hotspots of environmental change across the world. Um, and then to move in with a, uh, a substantial mixed uh, methodology, uh, resources for, for surveying, for doing detailed, uh, in-depth qualitative work using what secondary data are available, sophisticated measurement of environmental change. And I think they're the sorts of studies which are going to be uh, most useful. But I think it's important to do them where we know environmental change is, is currently quite significant. In my own area, um, there are islands in the Pacific where I think this could be done, uh, where there's substantial change. And I think Bangladesh, to me, is really the canary in the coal, coal mine for climate change. Uh, it's, it's a country of very substantial populations, which is uh, likely to be 
uh, one of the uh, areas most affected by climate change in the, uh, over the next couple of decades. And the last question is, what do you think are some key questions and issues for future study of this relationship, its causes, its consequences? Already you've mentioned uh, that currently studies tend to focus uh, or make the mistake of treating everyone the same, whereas we know that migration is highly selective. So um, how, might we, how might we change that for future research? I guess uh, in terms of research priorities, I think the first priority really um, is an empirical one. We, we don't have uh, substantial empirical studies uh, available which really look at this um, complex interaction between environmental change and migration um, in, in, a, in a way which actually is sophisticated in terms of environment but also looks at it fully in terms of, of migration. And I think um, building up our empirical base, which is partly the sort of case studies that I was mentioning previously, but I think the 2010 population census round in which most countries in the world had a, uh, a census most of them collected information on internal migration. I think we really do need to uh, undertake a very substantial analysis of that internal migration data across a number of countries and relate that to, um, uh, to, to environmental change. I think there's a real window of opportunity around that which is, which is significant. So, um, and, and I think the other element which we could do with that is actually recognise um, the differentials between different groups in, in their response to migration. I think the part of the, um, the need for empirical uh, data, empirical information to base our, our advances on in the future is that we really do need to look at issues of vulnerability between different subgroups in the population and what that means, not just in terms of the impact of environment, but what it means in terms of, of mobility. Um, you know, to me, uh, the, the fact is that the poorest of the poor really, in most cases, don't have migration available to them as a safety valve, as an option uh, for any crisis, let alone uh, environment or otherwise. And uh, to me, there's a real policy issue there of how do we um, break down those constraints and make it available to those, uh, those groups uh, in uh, uh, when you do get dire environmental circumstances. So, so the first thing is, is empirical. The second um, area of work, I, I believe, uh, which is needed, relates to moving out of seeing migration as a, in, in a paradigm of response, that migration is a coping mechanism. Migration is seen as a way of dealing with crisis, a way of of dealing with the crisis of environmental change. I think we need to see it more broadly. Migration can also be an opportunity. Um, migration can also facilitate economic development and social change in communities. It can be a positive factor. Now, can we bring those things together? Uh, we are going to see enormous mobility of populations over the next coming decades. Um, there's going to be significant urbanisation, there'll be significant international migration. How do we make those work so that the people involved in them um, can improve their uh, lives? How do we use that to overcome poverty? And equally, you know, how do we blend into that um, uh, the environmental issue? Currently, migration and development, migration and environment are two um, silos of research activity. I think we need to bring them, uh, bring them together and, and start seeing migration as a potential opportunity as well as a, uh, a way of, de uh, of dealing with crisis.